Thank you everyone for joining this call and um, talking about um, rights retention and how exploring how the Plan S strategy could apply globally. Um, you'll find out lots more about the Plan S strategy. I will not be trying to explain this fully. We have Sally Rumsey and Johan Ruhrig from Coalition S who will be able to talk more and explain what's going on. Simply to say that this is a really fascinating, a really exciting area of development of open access at the moment that crosses over in a really exciting way with how we can make sure that the people who are doing the research, the people who are writing are actually empowered as well. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Johan Rurik and Sally Rumsey. Johan Rurik uh, from Coalition S is going to run uh, this session. I would note, as said, we are going to be recording the event, so it will be possible to list, list back afterwards. You should see in the at the bottom of your screen a, a, a questions and answers button. So please do use that to ask your own questions. Straight after Johan and Sally, we're very pleased to be welcoming Diana Chan, uh, Yasar Tonta, and Ramesh Gaur, who will be our lead uh, respondents. So, so with that, I'm just going to hand over straight away to Johan so we can get right into the substance. So Johan, over to you. Okay, allow me to share my screen. Um, okay, here we go. So um, I will be driving the slides even when uh, Sally and um, uh, Neha are talking. So we are, today we would like to introduce the, the rights retention strategy of Coalition S because it is a, a, a strategy um, uh, that we have developed that does not just apply to um, uh, Coalition S uh, funders, but it could also be adopted by individual researchers and by universities. And that's why we're trying to get that message out. Um, um, so let me briefly introduce myself. I'm the executive director of Coalition S. Sally Ramsey works at GISC, but also is, um, uh, is working for Coalition S as the, uh, our open access expert. And Nia Vias is working at uh, Welcome Trust as Associate Legal Counsel. Um, um, for whom uh, is this uh, seminar intended? Well, for organizations related to higher education research, staff in libraries uh, and uh, staff assisting researchers in uh, any capacity, uh, librarians, research office staff and senior research support staff who, who determine policy. Um, uh, our agenda for today will be uh, an overview of the Plan S Rights Retention Strategy. What does it do? How does it work? Uh, then uh, Sandy will present briefly about the Rights Retention Strategy resources that we have, namely resources that we put at the disposal of the community to explain this to their staff, how it works. And then there will be uh, some time for questions and answers. Um, just for completeness sake um, uh, and as a disclaimer, uh, if there's any discrepancy between the information presented here and the Coalition S website, the website takes, takes precedence, just in case we inadvertently say things that, that are not in line with what is on the website. Um, what are our key objectives as Coalition S? Uh, you, as you know, we have developed Plan S, which wants immediate and full open access to research results that are supported in part or in whole by uh, our research funding. And um, to ensure that the Coalition S organization uh, 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 want to ensure that their research or the research results, publications resulting from their research are made uh, uh, open access with a CC by, by license and accessible through a repository as a very minimum. Uh, we also, of course, allow for gold open access or open access under transformative agreements. But if that is not possible, um, the least, the, the very uh, least condition that we are uh, imposing on, on our authors is that uh, their article should be available in a repository um, with the CC BY license. Um, now, this um, is to ensure that the funded researchers have access to all possible uh, journals and as wide variety of journals as possible, namely also subscription journals and even hybrid journals that who that not, have not yet developed a transformative arrangement. And uh, we want with the rights retention strategy to make sure that authors retain sufficient rights to be able to use and reuse their, their work as they choose, as they choose. As our chair, uh, Mark Schultz always says, the, manuscript is uh, 
something that belongs to the researcher, even after peer review. It is something that belongs to the researcher. It's not something that should be owned by uh, a publisher. And to uh, encourage subscription publishers to consider developing uh, transformative arrangements, we have, the, uh, we have developed a strategy as well, namely uh, by adopting the Wines Retention Strategy, this will hopefully encourage uh, publishers to move away from the subscription model and to move towards an open access model. Uh, whether that be by transformative agreements or by transformative journals, uh, but we want, we definitely want to provide an incentive to move away from the uh, subscription model. Um, at this, from the outset, we would like to stress that as Coalition S funded, we have a clear preference for the version of record, for the, an open access version of record for which we pay wherever that is possible. So we do want to pay for the version of record when that is possible except when that is in a hybrid uh, open access uh, journal. So we definitely want uh, all journals to move over to a full open access model. And so the AAM will only need to be made open access when there is no plan as a lined way to make the version of record open access. So basically what we're telling publishers is make sure that all of your journals move to a complete open access model and then we will pay for the version of record. If you are not willing to do that, if you want to remain in hybrid under a hybrid model or under a subscription model, then we will ask our authors to make the AAM, the author accepted manuscript, available in a repository because that's for us the only way to make sure that our publications are made available in open access. You can keep the version that is behind the paywall, that is fine with us, and in, in that sense, uh, the AAM has been paid for, but we will keep, we will make sure that our authors retain the rights on the author accepted manuscript. So we encourage institutional repositories to hold a copy of that work, either the VOR or the AAM, to assist with preservation as well. So the minimum requirement, what is the problem that we are seeking to solve? The minimum requirement for us well, is clearly that the author accepted manuscript should be in a repository with zero embargo and a CC by license, so that it is accessible for everyone to read. That is the minimum requirement. Uh, we make this an obligation through the Coalition as Organization Grants Agreement. So as of uh, the 1st of January, uh, a number of our organizations and some of the organizations will implement this a little bit later, but all of our organizations take as part of their uh, coalition as uh, grant agreements, they make it an obligation for authors to make the, at least the AAM available in a repository. Um, now, at the same time, we realize full well, of course, that many researchers will sign a publishing agreement that gives away their rights to deposit the AAM in a repository with CC BY and with the CC BY license and zero embargo. Uh, authors are, are required by publishers to sign a, 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 a copyright transfer agreement and thereby very often lose their rights, lose any rights to the manuscript that they have themselves written and that they have intellectual rights to, in our opinion. So this means that there is a contradiction between the researcher's grant agreement on the one hand uh, uh, and the publishing agreement with the publishers on the other. So basically, uh, researchers are between a rock and a hard place, between the rock of, so to speak, of their research and grant agreement and the hard place of the publishing agreement which requires them to hand over their rights. Well, we ask them to preserve their rights, uh, they are asked by the publishers to hand over their rights. What the rights retention strategy is trying to do, is aiming to do, is to resolve this contradiction and I uh, will tell you how in, in a minute. Um, so, I don't know what happened there. So basically we have a three-step model for delivering this. Uh, we will update our grant conditions. Uh, the grant conditions of all coalition uh, uh, funders are being updated as we speak and have or have been updated as of the 1st of January. We have notified the publishers of these changes. We will notify the publishers that all publications by coalition as funders uh, now come automatically with a CC by license and and we will also require beneficiaries in order to make this strategy watertight. We will require beneficiaries, so grant holders, to, to include details of that public license. So basically every author has to say, their publisher, be aware of the fact that the manuscript that I am submitting to you already carries a CC by license upon submission. So because my grant conditions require this. So the publisher has to be informed. The publisher is informed in two ways. 
both by the by the uh, granting organization, the funder, the coalition as funder on the one hand, and by the individual author, because of course the publisher cannot know which author is funded by which uh, fun which which funder is funding the the author authors. Um, that is not always clear. Um, so we will change the, these grant conditions so that the beneficiaries apply a public uh, copyright license to all their future uh, author accepted manuscripts. So that becomes a contractual obligation. And the, the authors will have to specify this public copyright license that has been applied as well as the source of their funding. Um, so that, uh, and then finally, they uh, we mandate, or the coalition as funders mandate, that these manuscripts be made available at the time of publication in an open access repository of, of their choice. So that's the that's the first step. The second step is something that we did over the summer of 2020, namely we contacted the publishers who pu publish about 95% of research uh, attributed to coalition as organization. And we uh, organized webinars and we talked to publisher trade bodies. I think we talked to about uh, 100 uh, publishers over, over the summer in various webinars uh, to, in to inform them of these changes. And we also invited the publishers to respond how they will how they will react to uh, uh, author accepted manuscripts that are licensed CC by, by or how they will react to submissions that carry that language that carry the language saying look publisher be aware my my uh, my article already carries a CC by license in accordance with my grant agreements. We uh, we ask publishers this to be able to incorporate that information in the journal checker tool that we are developing and that I will talk to you about in in a minute. Uh, and then the step three is that we provide our researchers with templated language that they can include either in the submission letter or in the acknowledgement sec section, but it should be in the submission, um, ideally. Uh, a templated language of the following sort. This research was funded in all in part by organization name. Uh, please, please, publisher, be aware that the CC BY license already applies to, 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 this, to this article. Uh, for instance, uh, let's, let's look at the way Welcome does this. Welcome is one of the coalition S organizations who is applying this policy to all of their grants as of 1st of January. Uh, they require, I mean, since they do a very specific type of research and they fund a very specific type of research, they ask that all original research um, supported by the grant must be made available in one repository, namely Europe Government Central. Um, they also still tell researchers that they uh, um, grant a CC by public uh, copyright license to all future AAMs and uh, they must uh, ensure that that license is granted. And they have to include, uh, all authors have to include the following language in, in, in their submissions. So that gives you a very good idea of what welcome requires of authors to do uh, in, the in, in the future, uh, as, of, as of 1st of January. Um, now, of course, we have to make it easy for researchers. Uh, one of the things that we know, of course, is that we want to, uh, that there are various ways uh, with Plan S to get to open access. On the one hand, there is gold open access, where uh, the author pays or the uh, grant, uh, uh, the granting organization pays for open access. There's other, other journals that are under a transformative agreement. And then there are the hybrid open access journals and the subscription journals that require um, authors to deposit the a, a version under AM of the article in a repository. How is an author to know what applies to each journal? And we want, our, of course, our grant holders to be able to identify how their journal of choice, the journal that they want to publish in, aligns with Plan S, Plan S policy. And that's why we have developed a, a journal checker tool um, in collaboration with Cottage Labs and in, in partnership with Antleaf. Um, um, the, there's an image missing here, I don't know what's happening, but it's, an, uh, it's a combination basically that allows um, the author to find out by typing in their, grant, uh, their, their granting organization, typing in their, 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 the name of the journal, the, the granting organization and their university, that combination yields a result telling them what they have to do. Now, for instance, if the journal is under transformative agreement, 
uh, because they work at a, a university that has signed transformative agreement, then the author is informed that that, uh, that that article is subject to the transformative agreement and that they don't need to do anything else because the article will automatically be published in open access. However, if the article, if the journal of choice of the author is a hybrid journal or a subscription journal, then they will be told to uh, deposit a copy of the AAM in, in a repository. First iteration of that journal checker tool is available since November 2020. You can check it out. I'll give you a link at the end of, of this presentation. Um, now, what do, do authors need to do? Uh, I think that is, that is very simple. They only have to inform the publisher that the AM resulting from their submission carried that CC BY copyright license in their submission uh, letter using what we call the magic language to inform the, 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 the author. That is all they need to do. And on publication, they need to deposit the AAM in a repository. So two things included in the submission and deposit the AAM in a, in a repository. And now I'll pass um, the floor to Sally to tell us about uh, uh, the, 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 the resources. Again, here there are some images missing and I, I don't really know why. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Um, thank you, Johan. Um, we've made a, a few uh, resources available for the community to use um, to make it easier for you um, so that you've got to hand just the summary of what the Plan S is about, um, not Plan S, sorry, the rights retention strategy is about, and so that you can explain it easily directly to researchers. I mean, Generally, we think that researchers don't need to know all the, all the deep details of how this is and why it works, but they just really need to know what they need to do and why. So what we've done is, as well as the infographic that um, uh, we had before, that's uh, available to give a sort of overview, but then there is um, a handout which can be freely reproduced and distributed and you can um, add your organizational details to that. There's a version that where you can do that and you can give that out if you've got say training sessions or, or if you're just uh, have an interested researcher or just want to publicize the rights retention strategy more. Then if um, it's useful, there are some slides. There are two um, sets of slides. One is just a single slide. I mean, I know from experience when you're invited to a university committee to talk about something like the rights retention strategy, you're often given like two minutes at the end of the, the meeting when you have to skate over things very quickly. And a single slide um, gives just a summary of the rights retention strategy so that you can um, quickly fill in the details for people. And then there's a more fulsome five slide deck um, that has more details on there. I should also mention that um, we've published some practical advice about the technical requirements for repositories. So you may have seen the technical requirements for repositories in Plan S. There's a bit more detail now on the Plan S website and they should help institutions with the implementation of their repositories and how they can meet the Plan S requirements. And um, many of the requirements really are sort of standard aspirations for repositories, things like um, persistent identifiers. That's on the uh, Coalition S website, along with these resources that you can have. And just a bit of extra publicity. Um, if you're interested in repositories, there is currently, um, I've written a, a, a series of blogs on repositories. Uh, Part two was just published yesterday, and that's again on the Coalition S website under the soap box, uh, which is the Coalition S blog. So please do have a read of that if you're interested in repositories. And at this point, I'll hand over to Neha. Thank you. Um, I apologise in advance for any background noise. I've got some building work going on, so I'm, I'll battle with my um, volume um, over that. Um, so under UK copyright law, and indeed a lot of other jurisdictions, it's clear that an assignee or an exclusive licensee, for example, the publisher, um, will take the assignment or exclusive license that they get from an author, a researcher, subject to any prior licenses that the author has entered into and has given them notice of. So the, um, when the researcher accepts 
um, funding from a coalition S funder and agrees to the grant conditions that um, stipulate exactly what Johan has outlined. Um, they agree that they will make the author accepted manuscript available on a, under a public copyright license. Um, so when by the time they enter into a publishing agreement with the publisher at a late stage, um, they've already give, they have to give them notice by inserting the magic language that we've mentioned. Um, and so that prior license that they've um, agreed to with the publish with the um, funders under the fund funders grant conditions will trump any of the any conflicting language that might be inserted into the publishing agreement. Um, and so is the initial submission itself also covered by the CC by license? No, but the author, the researcher should make sure that they give notice to the publisher that the um, author accept the manuscript has been licensed under a public copyright license, the CC by license, um, or for example, a non-derivative license, CC by ND. We um, were thinking about a situation where there might be a disagreement with the publisher. And because of that, um, a publisher may issue a takedown notice to a repository. So what the Coalition S has decided to do in order to handle this is that repository managers can direct any request for takedown for any item that falls under a Co Coalition S funder. This is not just for any, any item in their repositories, it's just for those which are funded by Coalition S funders. They can then turn to their funder and say that they've had um, a takedown request from a publisher. The funder will then investigate and check out whether there was prior notice given to that publisher, and they will um, ascertain whether the takedown notice should be refuted or adhered to, they will advise the repository and then the repository can act accordingly. Um, authors, it should be, should be stressed, authors would not be expected to do the investigation. So hopefully that will make it a lot easier for everybody involved. And um, yes, there's further information, of course, on our website. Uh, the, you have these, um, I'll, I'll make sure that you get a proper PDF with, with all pictures included because something went wrong with my presentation today. I uh, apologize for that. It's very important, I think, in conclusion to, to stress that the way the rights retention strategy works is, as Nea already said it, is by, by priority. Namely, the fact that uh, an author or an institution or a, a funder has already told, has already claimed CC BY on the publication upon submission, that works as a prior contract, so to speak, uh, of which you inform then the publisher and then the publisher cannot, uh, uh, get, or the, the, the contract that is then entered with the publisher about the copyright is then null and void with respect to that previous copyright. It, it's basically, um, the idea is basically that the CC BY license that is applied to the manuscript upon submission takes precedent over any later copyright agreement that is, that, that is signed. Any later copyright agreement, even if it is signed by the author, is null and void. Uh, of course, we prefer to avoid that, but it's it, the rights retention strategy really works by, by, by legal precedence of the, of the license. That's the essence, I believe. And uh, uh, you can contact us, of course, individually on these, on these addresses, and I'll stop sharing now and open the paper for questions and answers. So Thank you very much, Johan, Sally, Nehan. Sorry, Nehan, for not introducing you at the beginning. So we're very happy to have three lead respondents here who will lead off with questions, and I'll introduce them shortly. I've already seen that two questions have come up in the Q&A box. Um, and so Johan, Sally, Nehan, please, of course, do take a look and be ready to, to answer. Um, hopefully you can find them. Um, what then, so first of all, I'd like to turn to, to Professor Yasar Tonta from the Department of Information Management of Hasatepe University in Ankara in Turkey. So Professor Tonta, would you like to, to go first in, in sharing initial responses and any questions you have? Uh, thank you, Stephen. 
Uh, thank you, Johan, Sili, and Neha as well uh, for this um, presentations. Um, <clears throat> of course, um, uh, it's um, uh, very important to increase the percentage of open access articles, be it uh, through green uh, open access or gold open access. Uh, and uh, it appears that uh, with the plan S, if everything goes all right, uh, the percentage will increase an additional 10% uh, within the overall um, uh, papers um, published or indexed by the Web of Science at least. Um, um, I, I, when the minimum requirements uh, mentioned by Johan, um, uh, states that um, AAM uh, should be um, deposited in, um, in a repository with zero embargo and uh, CC by license. I can't help but think that uh, green open access could actually already um, um, achieve this, uh, even uh, not during the uh, uh, publication at the time of publication, but whenever the paper um, is published, uh, I'm sorry, is accepted by the uh, referees. So I'm wondering uh, uh, what I'm missing here in terms of um, Plan S uh, or Coalition S funders um, um, can I, adding to that. Yeah, can I, I? I'll gladly answer that. What I think, you, what, what I think, uh, it, it is true, like you said, that it is possible to deposit the article. Uh, on um, on a repository once it is accepted by by the referees. The trouble is that, that most of the time uh, uh, publishers will impose an embargo period on such a deposit for six months or twelve months, and that is what we want to avoid. And That's by doing this, by by having this strategy, we avoid we, we avoid that and we allow for deposit in a repository immediately on publication. But Sally, you wanted to Can I, yeah, I just come in there. I, I think, um, Professor Tonta, um, if I understand you correctly, um, we, we've said that um, it should be deposited in a repository at publication, mm -hmm. and that's what that's what Plan S requires. Now then, um, I've been a repository manager, and I know it's much easier actually if if people do actually put it in and it's made available at. Um, acceptance and in, in um, the UK certainly that's what we've been doing because of a requirement from a, a government rec funder requirement here that we've had so yes some publishers already say I think the Royal Society is one of them they already say that you can make your um, your ac your accepted manuscript freely available from acceptance I think that's what you were you were saying wasn't it and certainly with the rights retention strategy that that would Stand, I think, nay, I might, might contradict me here, but it means that that paper has got no embargoes on it and it's CC by at that point. And so an author could um, deposit it at acceptance and make it available prior to publication. Now, sometimes um, they might, um, and I don't know how this will come in, play out, but um, if there's a sort of press embargo or something on things that might that might have a bit of an effect on it but if I understand you correctly what you're saying is making it um, available at acceptance and from a repository perspective what um, we would probably want people to do in practice is deposit at acceptance because that's when there's a touch point with the author and something's happening the author often forgets at publication or they don't know when it, the actual date when it's been published and then and make it available as soon as possible. But the Plan S requirement is that it's made available from public, the date of publication. So that's all that's required to, to meet your, your funders' um, uh, rules, as it were. Thank you. Um, if I may continue. Um, I think um, it seems to me that plan is, uh, plan is, is um, still a little bit um, gold open access centric, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, and uh, when we look at the percentage uh, wise, um, uh, we are talking about basically the uh, coalition S uh, members uh, and uh, half of the papers actually um, plan S compliant papers coming from the European Union. I'm wondering uh, when I saw uh, Stephen's um, title, uh, plan S could apply globally. 
especially when I think of um, you know uh, the um, big players like uh, USA or uh, China or India. Uh, when uh, do you think the uh, critical point will be reached in terms of uh, planist uh, compliant papers being uh, populated uh, within uh, web of science or indexed um, uh, platforms or institutional repositories or whatever? Do you have any um, um, sort of um, Plan B beyond uh, 2024, for instance, if uh, things don't go as um, as is envisaged by the uh, Plan S, uh, when it comes to um, you know uh, reaching the um, percentage by publishers uh, to call them uh, open access journals, what happens, for instance, uh, when the uh, publishers do not agree to? Um, uh, sort of make their publications uh, open access at the end of uh, 2024, and still they are um, not in the 75% um, level when it comes to the um, uh, open access journals, uh, uh, open access papers published in their journals. Thank you. Yes. Well, there's, there's various things we can do. We don't have a plan B uh, com completely ready, but in any case, we, we are trying to make um, publishers uh, com uh, yeah, com uh, transition to, to, to full open access by our transformative journal framework and by other frameworks. And they are, they are responding to that. As you can see, uh, you know, Springer Nature and Elsevier have already uh, agreed to the transformative journals framework so we and that means that they commit to trans transitioning those journals within uh, a limited number of years to 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 full to full open access um, uh, critical point I, I don't think we have a critical point in in, in mind it really uh, uh, depends also a lot on on how uh, quickly uh, publishers indeed will be adopting our policies it also depends a lot i think I, on the pressure that uh, the the scientific community can exert and one of the ways of exerting uh, pressure is by using the rights retention strategy. The rights retention strategy is certainly not gold oriented, um, right? I mean, basically claims back the rights on the publication uh, to, uh, for the authors. It basically says, authors, you have a right to that publication even after peer review. Uh, publishers, of course, uh, needless to say, do not agree with that perspective. What we are clearly trying to tell, to, uh, tell them is, look, if you make uh, uh, these papers, if you ma make your journal available in a way that we can pay, we will, we will pay uh, for the version of record. And otherwise, the article will appear in a repository um, uh, as, as, as the AM, which is still in uh, possession, in the possession of the authors. So we hope very much that many um, um, uh, many organizations and authors outside of coalition has, will adopt this rights retention strategy, which in itself is, is, is really not gold oriented uh, at, at all. We are also looking into, uh, I mean, I do understand the concerns about gold and about transformative agreements. And we are uh, looking this year, we will be looking into alternative ways of uh, uh, paying for, the, for academic publishing. Because uh, like you said, I mean, it's, it, it's Academic publishing, as it stands now, and called open access, is, is is very expensive and certainly not um, equitable in uh, in the sense that it treats uh, uh, rich and poor countries alike. I mean, whether you whether you are work in Turkey uh, or in India or in Norway, you basically pay the same APC for, a, for for an article. That is very strange because I mean, many very few products work that way. You know, plane tickets, uh, Coca-Cola bottles, I mean, have a differential price uh, depending on, 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 on where you consume the product. For an APC, that's, it's the same price for everyone. That's, that's very strange. And the, the, there are uh, other ways and that have been tried already uh, of, 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 of that are, and that are more equitable to pay for academic publishing. I mean, we are in a full transition. I mean, many different models are being, uh, are being uh, tried out. Uh, for, for this. Um, we're also looking into diamond journals, how we can support diamond journals where authors do not pay. Uh, so this entire system is in transition and you have to, you have to give some time for it to, 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 to settle again. So it's very hard to say 
or to predict beforehand uh, when there will be a, a complete tipping point that, that we can all uh, live with and then go to the beach and uh, do nothing. Uh, but yeah, we try to, what we try to do at Coalition S is very much to try to use various integrated policies. On the one hand, we're telling publishers, yes, we will pay for gold open access. Uh, one way or another, transformative agreements or differently, we will try to get the prices down. On the other hand, we are trying to write retention strategy, we are trying to support diamond open access journals. All of these strategies we try to integrate. Johan, can I just come sure. in there as well? Um, I think it's also, it's notable, as I've said in the blog, that there are three routes to, to open access that are compliant with, with um, the Plan S. Uh, well, two main routes, both of the gold route, but also the green route, it is compliant. And so therefore, just being mindful that there are other preferences around the world, you know, maybe um, the majority of, of Coalition S funders do prefer that there's a, a flip to gold, but there are other countries in the world that have different directions. And so that, that having that green route there does allow for different preferences of, you know, which, which way people want to go. So I think it's it's sort of recognizing that and making sure that it's not cutting off one of the routes to open access as well. So looking as we've got two more lead respondents to go, so I'd very much like now to turn to Professor Ramesh Sigao, who's Professor and Dean at the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts in India. So Professor Gao, what your, your initial reactions on, on the rights retention strategy? Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thanks, John, uh, Sally, Neha, for wonderful presentations. Uh, before coming to right retention strategy, I have a little different questions. I don't know how relevant, relevant it is. See, initially in India, sometime last year, there was some discussion among uh, academics and policymakers to adopt Plan S. But uh, after some time, uh, it, it turned into different direction. Now there are some discussion to adopt uh, one nation, one subscription model. So that one nation, one subscription model is also not finalized. It is under discussion. So I just need to understand uh, from all of you, do you see any, any connection uh, between this, uh, this discussion? Uh, like while discussing this one nation, one subscription model, do you think India can think of adopting some of the, yes. uh, the strategy yeah. what you have discussed? So, uh, yes. Because I will, be, I will be participating in some conclave next, uh, next week. So if you can give me some, some uh, ideas, so then, then I can further uh, forward. Yes, I, 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 read, um, I, I read part of this um, document that, that was recently released for India, the uh, STIP, I believe it's called, or something like that. Um, science, science and Technology yes. Policy Innovation. Yes, about. indeed. And one of the things that struck me there is that the, the idea is indeed that all articles will be deposited in a public repository, right? And that it, it says that, it, it says that very explicitly. But what struck me there is that that strategy is not legally backed up. I mean, what the advantage, and I also wrote this to, to, to the minister, to Vijay Regiment. Uh, I said, look, I mean, one of the things that I, we, th we think is strong in our rights retention uh, policy is that this rights retention uh, policy legally backs up the deposit in a, in a repository in the sense that it, um, it requires no uh, embargo Right, it can, the, the deposit can be immediate because you claim, uh, as a researcher, you claim that, that that CC by license, that prior license on the article exists, uh, which, which prevents a copyright transfer agreement, a copyright transfer to the publisher, of course, and automatically allows you to deposit the article in a, in a repository. So my recommendation would be for India to adopt this as well in the STIP, namely the, the, uh, that the, some version of the rights retention strategy would be incorporated in this plan to make sure that all articles will be deposited in a, in a repository. That would be my recommendation. And, and that would be sort of 
that would be sort of coalition s route wouldn't it as well one yes, of the it would, well yeah. it would enhance i mean yeah. this is the strategy that you're adopting you're adopting the strategy of depositing articles in a repository what we are suggesting is to to reinforce that legally by the by the strategy that we have developed and that should be ap applicable as well in, in in india because basically the rights retention the way it works is basically by saying look there is a prior contract here that uh, their publisher there is a prior contract here between the funder and the uh, and the uh, uh, and the author that you need to respect uh, or the the or there is a prior license here that is claimed by the author as an individual the author claims uh, this cc by license on their article and you have to respect that any later agreement that you want to impose or on top of that is null and void because of this prior license that, that's the idea it's, it's it's very basically an idea of priority. I mean, it took me some time to understand it as well. I'm talking to Neha and, 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 to, and to Chris Moran, but, but basically the idea is, it, it's like you when you rent, a, when, you, when you have any contract with, for renting a house, for instance, right? You cannot rent out a house that has already been rented out. <laughs> you know, there is a prior contract there that you have to respect. Absolutely. So if, I, I, what I understand that, uh... It is, to adopt this right retention strategy, uh, you don't require to adopt the plan S. It is independent of plan exactly. S. Exactly, uh, it is independent of plan S. You don't, do not have to uh, adopt plan S. The, the nice thing I think about plan S is that there are bits and pieces that you can use. I mean, we, we don't demand everybody to join us. You know, I mean, it's not, you know, one party rule or anything. Uh, basically, what we are looking for is not for everybody in the world to adhere to Plan S, but, but to adopt the policies that we've developed. One of the great things I think about Plan S is that we have all these specialist experts from around the world, from all these organizations that join. And together, of course, they have many more ideas than you could have on your own in, in any national uh, in any national remit. So we, we think about these policies and then we jointly move further. And then we propose them and anyone who wants to adopt them can adopt them. But I mean, not, you do not necessarily have to join Plan S in order to, to take advantage of them. Of course, we would very much prefer for India to join Plan S, that is, that is clear. But uh, nothing prevents you from adopting the policy. Some of the policies that we have developed while leaving, behind, uh, leaving aside others. Yeah, so another question uh, which uh, I have in mind, like uh, you talked about AM, AM. Uh, like we have several institutional repository uh, based on this uh, uh, copyright permission available on this Romeo Sherpa. Uh, so uh, how, how this AM model is different from uh, like existing, uh, where pub some publisher have allowed uploading preprint in institutional repository. And uh, in case, uh, like what are the important guide, guidelines or uh, important points uh, you would like to suggest for libraries to uh, create those institutional repository uh, following this AM? That's a question for Sally, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the, the problem with institutional repository deposit has been that there have been conflicting um, policies. So an author would deposit in the repository and you might have a policy that's been imposed by the publisher that says such and such an embargo. You might have a different policy that was imposed by the funder. And then you might even have another, a third policy, which is different again, which might be the institution or, or the government or something like that. And, you know, your poor repository person is sitting there thinking, what on earth do I do? And you have to go for the, you know, the one that you, you can fulfill that doesn't break any of them. And what this rights retention strategy does, it sort of cuts through all of that and says, hang on a minute, let's just forget this, you know. The, um, the item can be made freely available immediately, and it doesn't matter what all these other um, uh, rules are, that's what we're doing. The author's taking back that control, really, of their own work and making it freely available at acceptance. So your accepted manuscript, it doesn't apply, as Neha said in, on her slide, it doesn't apply to previous versions, just the accepted manuscript. Does that answer the question? I'm happy to... Yeah, uh, but uh, for adopting this right retention strategy, do you need any changes in the existing uh, copyright laws or 
or what kind of policy decisions policy uh, guidelines need to be uh, put in place uh, at the level of a uh, government or or institutions or uh, individuals like just yeah. just the the neha go ahead yes um <laughs> I, I mean i was just going to say i in terms of indian copyright law i'm not an expert on indian copyright law but certainly in the uk and a lot of other jurisdictions um it's clear that we don't need to change copyright law to be able to make the rights retention strategy work. There's already a mechanism in place that allows the prior CC BY license to take precedent precedence over an agreement that they a later agreement that they enter into with the publisher. So there's not necessarily any changes that are required to um, make that make that happen obviously that depends on the individual laws in every single jurisdiction which i'm not familiar with um but yeah if there's a jurisdiction that doesn't allow that then obviously changes would be required there i i, I know we have a time limitation in this uh, i i request you that i see similar kind of discussion on this one nation one subscription and other open access model in india i was very keen to organize a, a separate webinar focusing on indian uh, situations and uh, implementation so i may be requesting and traveling you for uh, more time for that particular webinar uh, with those sure. words i thank stefan and uh, thank you all for uh, very clearly uh, giving answers and uh, making me more knowledgeable on this subject thank you very much Thank you. I, I can see that the chair of our section on academic and research libraries is in the audience. So I hope the, the request, I'm sure, is noted. Um, so finally, and with particular thanks, I wanted to welcome Diana Chan, our last lead respondent. And she's the director of library services at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, as well as being chair of the JULAC Consortial Committee in Hong Kong. I wanted to thank her because she's made herself available at very short notice to join us. So. Diana, over to you, your, your responses, reactions. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Johan, uh, Sally, and also Naha uh, for giving us those uh, very uh, valuable information. Uh, I think, you know, the retaining the right retain uh, uh, the retaining the right strategy is a very uh, smart one, because I guess in the past, uh, if we relied on the researchers to fight with the publisher to uh, retain the copyright, and not to transfer their rights uh, to the publisher, it's a, it's a hard battle, it's an up, uphill battle. Um, many um, researchers won't do that. Uh, they just accept whatever the publishers ask them to do. So I think this is a very smart uh, strategy that uh, coalition has, uh, has taken uh, onto yourself to do it. Uh, but I, I would like to know that um, as you have, you said uh, in the past uh, six months or, or so, you have contacted more than 100 publishers on, on this. So from now, what is uh, the response from the publisher? Do you see that there is a pushback from the publisher or do you find that most of them are uh, pretty compliant to what uh, coalition asked them to do? That's, um, that's an excellent question. Uh, we can't really say that publishers have been compliant. I mean, we received on uh, the very last date that the re reactions were due, we received a number of letters of them saying that they declined to answer, uh, which is, of course, not something that we can that we can work with for the journal journal checker tool. And so when we insisted, when we inquired a bit more, they said that they would not, uh, they, they never said that they would refuse articles that came with the language. So none of the publishers that we contacted have explicitly contacted us to say, look, we will refuse any article that comes with the magic language, with the rights retention strategy language, which is good enough for us, right? Because as soon, of course, as they accept that paper, they recognize the, the CC by license claimed by the author. And then they have to treat that article further on. Also, don't forget that if they want to have access, if they want to be paid for the version of record, then they have to accept that article, right? They won't know beforehand whether the, the author will pay or will not pay for that version of record in a transformative journal, for instance. Mm. But but yes, there have been there have been some back and forth between publishers and ourselves. Publishers did not like this strategy at all. I mean, mm. 
Mm -hmm. they, they basically said, well, one of the things that they often said was, well, who is going to pay for that? You want access to the AAM, but who is going to pay for that? We invest a lot in peer review. Uh, forgetting, of course, that peer review is often done by the researchers themselves. So I wonder where the investment is, but okay, I, let's let's grant that. And then we said uh, in response, actually, uh, Sally came up with that answer is, well, in fact, this article will appear behind the paywall will be built and will in fact be covered by the subscription price that you are already charging. So the price is already covered, right? I mean, you are afraid that it will be that it will be deposited in a repository. But as Sally has also pointed out in one of her blogs, in, in fact, publishers should welcome this move of, of the article being available in a repository because it is already, it, it, it provides some publicity. The, one of the things they could do, for instance, publishers could do is to require the AEM to make reference to the VOR. And the VOR, of course, is a, is a version that is much more complete and that, that also authors want to be able to refer to. So, uh, there's, there's definitely reasons to distinguish the a AAM from, from, from the VOR um, that, 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 that we think are, are important, uh, even for publishers, even though they don't see that the, the, this way uh, for now. But Sally, you wanted to, you may want to add something to what I said. Um, I, I don't think I do really. I mean, it's, I think it's, um... You know, there are there are as I've said in the blog, there are lots of benefits of, of using repositories, and um, the in addition to the version of record. And one of the things I've said is sort of try before you buy. We know that a lot of people want to access a lot of works, you know, in order to 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 do their research, and if they haven't got access to everything, that can that can make a very hefty bill for somebody, you know, if they're trying to pay for everything. So it's a question if somebody can come to a repository, they can see, um, they can read the article and think, oh yeah, that, that's exactly what I want. And they, they're then more yeah. willing. And then they can also see whether, whether it's worth for them to pay for to, 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 to pay for yeah. the article, right? To have, and, access, to, to have access to the subscription side. And, uh, and Johan has already sort of hinted at this, but every repository that, that well, I'm pretty sure every repository I'm aware of anyway, will put in that DOI link to the version of record. And you can see from the outlinks from repository, that's where people go. They, a lot of people do their research via Google these days, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let me ask one more question. Uh, 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 what about book chapters and books? Um, does the plan as also cover them as well? This yes, strategy. We, 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 we do not have a policy yet on uh, open access book and book chapters, but we will develop one in the second half of the year. Um, mm -hmm. We are now looking into that. We have to set it up. Um, my, um, my, my hunch about book chapters is that they will be treated as, as articles mainly. Yeah? But it's something very, that is relatively easy to do. You can pay for the book chapter in, individually. That's one of the ways uh, forward. For books uh, themselves, for monographs, it's going to be a little bit harder, I think, and because there, um, there you have to take into account um, uh, the various countries and their various traditions, because books are very often uh, published in local in the local languages of the various funders. Uh, they're also more important in certain uh, areas of, of science than in others, especially in social sciences and humanities. Books may play a much larger role. Than in, um, than in STEM subjects. So we'll have to develop a, a, a policy that, that, that is general enough, uh, but, but leaves a lot of leeway to individual uh, countries uh, as well. But we will develop something this year, yes. Thank you, Johan. Thank you very much. So I realize we're coming up to time now, and obviously I wanted to, to especially say thank you on behalf of IFLA headquarters, to, to Johan, to Sally, to Neha for, your, for, for explaining so clearly um, what's going on, for the, the right to attention strategy and for sharing links. And of course, in particular to Yasser, to uh, Ramesh and to Diana for leading the conversation, asking such good questions. What I wanted to do now actually is pass the floor to Gulchin Crib, who is the chair of our academic and research library section and who has played such an important role in allowing these webinars to happen. So Gulchin, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, greetings from Australia. Um, as the chair of academic and research libraries section of IFLA, 
I'm delighted that Stephen was able to organize this, web this webinar series. This is the first of three, of course, and we're going to have two more next week. Um, and, and I was just delighted. I, I just loved the exchange of ideas and information and uh, knowledge. And I'm particularly grateful to Coalition S, Johan and uh, Sally and Niha. Thank you very much for your generous sharing. And also I want to thank Professor Yashar Tonta from Hacettepe University. Uh, and, and of course, I know Yashar from way back. And uh, Professor Ramesh Gar, who is a member of Academic and Research Libraries section. And Diana, she's a colleague from when I was in Singapore. So thank you so much. And, and thanks, Stephen. It's been a fantastic session. And I'm so glad that it's been recorded. So people who couldn't attend to, to, today's, well, it's tonight, it's nine o'clock in, in where I am in Australia, um, that they can go back because it's incredibly useful. Thank you very much. And good night from Byron Bay. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, thank you to everyone. Um, I've put in the chat, we have next webinars, both on the 18th of January, one at 12 p.m. CET, one at 6 p.m. CET, I apologize, those times are obviously less good for Asia Oceania. We've tried with the times to find moments that will discriminate as little as possible according to where people are in the world, because we know that's always an issue. So with that, just thank you once again. Uh, thank you to all of our, our, our speakers, to our lead respondents, and we'll get the recording up on the website as soon as we can. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank, Thank you all. Much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. It was Bye. nice to meet all of you virtually. Stay Likewise. safe. Likewise. Thank Likewise. you. Likewise. Yes. Bye -bye.